right, I've begun. All right, good morning slash good afternoon. I am uh, Lieutenant Colonel Kurt Mavis. I'm an attorney with the United States Air Force. I've uh, judged the, uh, the, the state and national competition for quite a few years now. I'll have uh, my fellow judges introduce themselves, hand it over to you, and then we'll get started. So Richard. My name is Richard Leiter. I'm professor and director of the Law Library at the University of Nebraska College of Law. Um, I've been judging state competitions for about 15 years, and this is my first time at the national level, and it's good to see you all. Candida, you're muted. Yep, thank you. Hi, my name is Candida Steele, and I'm retired as a judge on the U.S. Civilian Board of Contract Appeals. I handled federal government contract disputes around the country, and I've been judging with this program for 20 years now with great pleasure. So welcome, everybody. Hi, my name is Bella Stevens. Hi, I'm Eliza Blue. Hi, I'm Santil Mayapin. Hi, I'm Kapil Iyer. And we are Unit 5 from Maggie Walker Governor Schools in Virginia. And our sponsor is Mr. Olmscheider. Sam, good to see you again. All right. Well, folks, we'll be doing question one of Unit 5. I'll read that and then I'm um, excited to hear your responses. A result of the decision in Wisconsin v. Yoder is that any parent or guardian can refuse to let their child go to school beyond the eighth grade or learn about a subject by saying it's against their religious beliefs. Do you agree or disagree with this result of the decision, why or why not? What words, if any, are found in the US Constitution or in state constitutions that protect the right to an education? And how have courts balanced religious beliefs with other rights? Over to you. The purpose of separation of church and state is to keep forever from these shores the ceaseless strife that has soaked the soil of Europe in blood for centuries. As articulated here by James Madison, the concept of personal religious freedom has been instilled in Americans since the creation of the Republic. Religious life in the United States is largely left untouched by the government, allowing for a greater plurality of religion. This uniquely American religious pluralism is supported by two coexisting religion clauses in the First Amendment, the freedom of exercise and the freedom from establishment. The Free Exercise Clause's purpose is to ensure that religious Americans retain the right to practice and believe freely. Traditionally, the court has used strict scrutiny to evaluate limits on free exercise, such as in Sherbert v. Verner. As demonstrated in this case, regulations of a right under strict scrutiny must meet a compelling state interest, a narrowly tailored application, and must be the least restrictive means of doing so. The ideas explored in Sherbert were modified in Employment Division v. Smith, which permitted restrictions on religious action given a, quote, neutral law of general applicability. This case employed a belief action dichotomy reminiscent of Reynolds v. U.S. and shifted away from Sherbert's accommodation doctrine. With a new test of neutral general applicability, Smith greatly reduced plausible religious exemptions, a large majority of which gave unfair advantages to certain religious individuals. One area where both Smith and Sherbert uphold restrictions on free exercise is in the protection of public health. For example, during the COVID-19 pandemic, many states across the country placed restrictions on religious services. In May of 2020, the court ruled in favor of the governor of California's restrictions on churches in South Bay v. Newsom. But in November, the court switched sides in Roman Catholic Diocese v. Cuomo. While the court supported delegating the regulation of public health to the states, they found that Governor Cuomo's restrictions reached the point of targeting religious institutions, undermining free exercise. Additionally, the free exercise clause is often at play with public education, which is a right in all state constitutions, but not the national one. Griffin v. Prince Edward County ruled that states could not close public schools with the intent of denying education to a group based on race. But San Antonio v. Rodriguez concluded that the Equal Protection Clause did not create an absolute right to an education. Still, a constitutional right to education is best found in the First, Fourth, Fifth, and Ninth Amendments because an educated citizenry that understands these amendments is absolutely necessary to the operation of them. For example, the Takings Clause is useless if an uneducated citizenry is unaware of its protections. As proof of this, Washington and Madison championed a nationally established university to build an educated citizenry. Thus, 
While the search for a right to education in the 14th Amendment has been unclear, the perpetuation of our constitutional democracy necessitates a right to education. In Wisconsin v. Yoder, the right to education came into direct conflict with the religion clauses. The court struck down K-12 compulsory schooling laws after the Amish contended that their religion prescribed the removal of children from school after the eighth grade to go work on family farms. The court found that the state interests of having an educated populace and preventing child labor weren't compelling enough to justify the burden on their free exercise of religion. In considering only the interests of parents in the state, the Yoder court deprived children of their 14th Amendment substantive right of liberty to experience all dimensions of life through education and then independently discern their own religious conviction. Parents do have fundamental controls over children, but children evidently have a set of protections for their own rights. For example, Prince v. Massachusetts held that restrictions on child labor are constitutional in the interest of the child's 14th Amendment rights to life and liberty. This was true even when the labor was religiously justified because as Justice Rutledge wrote in the majority opinion, parents may be free to become martyrs themselves, but it does not follow that they are free to be martyrs of their children before they are old enough to make that choice for themselves. With that, we are ready for your questions, judges. Great. All right, thank you very much. Well, let me get it out of the way. Um, <clears throat> would the Wisconsin law have survived following the Smith case? And what do you think is the appropriate test? Because you talked about two different tests. What's the appropriate test for free exercise clause? So we think that the Smith test is the most appropriate with a neutral law of general applicability. I think that Wisconsin v. Yoder's decision would not be upheld by the Smith standard in the event that it does have an adverse effect on third parties, which are the other students in the classroom. Um, and I think for this reason, a neutral law of general applicability would not um, outline the same restrict or the same religious exemptions that were allowed with Yoder. Um, and I think because of this, we think that Yoder was wrongly decided. And in fact, it should have been that these students were supposed to stay in public education. Additionally, since the decision in Yoder, the facts underpinning the case have been shown to not be completely true. Since Yoder, most families uh, of Amish descent have lost possession of their family farms, and yet they continue to be able to pursue their religion perfectly. Uh, even with Sherbert, the, the holding was respect to cardinal virtues of a religion. And to place a Amish child inside of K through 12 education does not violate a cardinal virtue. Okay, well, on the other side of the coin, uh, what are the advantages and disadvantages of having an established religion? So uh, one of the reasons that the founders didn't want to have an established religion was because um, during the Great Awakening, uh, many uh, new sects of Protestantism uh, became such as Methodist and Baptist, and there was a large variety of religious beliefs. So having an established religion would have created conflict because of the many different sects of Christianity currently at play. And also the founders believed greatly in the equality of men and uh, allowing one religion to favor over another would not be uh, allowing that equality to continue. While agreeing with my colleague that in the United States, for example, it would disincentivize non-conformist religions from existing, on the flip side, we see an advantage of having an established religion in other countries, such as in the Middle East, where we see religion as a unifying factor for the population. Unlike in the United States, where diversity plays a large role in our political and religious culture, that's not necessarily true in other countries. Additionally, we see that a lot of states uh, historically had a tradition of establishment as well as of uh, religious prayer in the legislature. And they did this because they greatly studied the um, Republican theorists and philosophers of ancient Roman Greece, who believed that having a small homogenous group uh, and that uh, homogeneity is brought in by establishment tends to help um, develop following the laws and creating laws that everybody supports. But as America has grown, we've become to separate from that. 
I think contrarily, it is really important that we don't have an establishment of religion because the establishment clause protects both individuals in minority religions, individuals in majority religions, as well as non-religious individuals in general. It makes it so that we are able to have this uniquely American religious pluralism. And that's why the Smith decision was so important because not only does it, in, um, does it protect individuals who are not religious, but also you can see in Lukumi Babalu Ai versus Hialeia, um, the inverse effects of the Smith decision, which has restricted laws that specifically target specific religions. Um, so I think that it's important that we don't have an establishment of religion for this reason. Okay, I'm glad that you uh, raised this um, issue, is as we're talking about religious beliefs, um, we are, and the Yoder decision was characterized by the beliefs of the parents vis-a-vis -vis the students. Where do the students fit into all this? Should their uh, religious beliefs be considered when the court is uh, deciding uh, how to apply these, um, the requirement for education? Well, that's an excellent question because if you actually looked at the transcript of the case, the children were actually asked to say one thing and the entire time they said a single word, they said yes to affirm their parents' religion, not their own. What I will say is that the ethos of the family is embedded into common law and our constitutional history. So anything that affects the construction of the family uh, is generally in the dominion of the parents. However, when it doesn't have to do directly with the construction of the family, I think we really do have to consider the interests and rights of the children more. Such a, and we, I mean, the court's already done this multiple times, such as in Planned Parenthood v. Danforth, where uh, children were granted a freedom to an abortion without parental consent, and Safford's United School District v. Reading, where students had protection against unlawful circumcision by adults. Even considering this structure of the family that my colleague brought up, I would still say that the children's interest should trump other interests brought up by the court, particularly because if we don't consider the children's interest in the case like Yoder v. Wisconsin, we see children falling into a perpetual, per perpetual cycle of following the same cultural values and going into the same jobs or the same communities that their parents were in and the generations before them were in. Which is the point, isn't it? Wasn't that the point of Yoder? Yes, that was the point of Yoder, but in doing so, we argued that they deprived the, the children's 14th Amendment right, because even though the point was to continue that cycle of Amish culture, some children, as they grow up, do not want to continue that cycle, and they find it difficult to break away from those shackles of their cultural expectations without having an education to expose them to the outer world. Well, when, at what point do the children get to make that decision? I think the children are able to make the decision once they have absorbed the knowledge from education that gives them the ability to make their own living. One of the greatest shackles put onto children by this decision is that when they leave eighth grade, they don't have any knowledge to you know, become economically independent. They must work on the family farms, whatever else, uh, whatever else religious labor that the family or community provides. I think additionally, we could look at this the same way that we look at speech in schools through Tinker versus Des Moines, which established that, you know, schools do have this compelling state interest of protecting children's education. And I think if we look at the fact that in Tinker, they established that your speaking rights can be limited unless it is a disruption to the learning environment, we could see religion in the same lens that, you know, these students should not have been able to drop out of school because of the fact that they do have a compelling state interest in protecting their education. Now we're going to quickly run out of time, but I want to I want to talk about the the confluence of the establishment clause and the free exercise clause. Isn't there an inherent violation of the establishment clause every time the court rules on the free exercise clause? <laughs> Absolutely not. I would say that in certain areas, both of those clauses play extraordinarily well, to, extraordinarily well together, and the court has been consistent. For example, in the issue of religious affiliation and eligibility for public office, in McDaniel v. Patey, the court ruled that a Tennessee law preventing clergy members from running for office violated the free exercise clause. But in Tercaso v. Watkins, the court ruled that a Maryland law requiring candidates seeking office to declare their belief in God to be eligible to run violated the establishment clause. So in both of these cases, the court has ruled that the establishment clause and the free exercise clause play extraordinary well to make a secular government. All right. Thank wow. you.
Maybe I shouldn't have opened that that box at the very end. All right. All right. Thank you. Uh, Canada, turn it over to you. Okay. Well, that was really a wonderful, wonderful presentation. Every time we turned around, there was a whole new layer of information that you gave yeah. us. Thank you so much. It was really thrilling. I mean, even going to labor law, talking about children um, and abortion without parental consent, you really had a very strong understanding of the implications of all of this and the subtleties of all of it. So thank you very much. It was really a pleasure listening to all of you. Um, and as a result, I must say, um, I've just moved on Friday from Maryland to Maine, but as a Maryland resident right next to Virginia, I would be very happy to have all of you representing us down the road. You have done a really sterling job, and if I hope that this has inspired you um, not just to be good citizens, but to use your experience to represent the rest of us, because we need people in government to know as much as you all do. You certainly know more than anybody in my law school class knew about the Constitution after a year of constitutional law. So um, congratulations. You really have done a stunning job, and it's been a pleasure listening to you. And, and I'm going to be just fine in my rocking chair knowing that you all are in charge. So thank you very much. It was a great job. And, and to, to, to add to what uh, Candida said, um, you, you don't just know the, the law. But you're conversant in it, and that's a there's a different level of understanding and comfort with material. I'm blown away. Um, you uh, are are you know what you're talking about? I thought that your uh, presentation was uh, excellent. It was um, articulate. You did a all did a great job. You should be very proud. Yeah, I, uh, I I will continue to echo that. Um, well done, congratulations. The breadth was amazing. Here's my challenge to you, and I know Sam will correct me if I'm wrong off camera at some point in time. You start off by telling me how important religious freedom is. And then when I challenge you on the test, you do minimum scrutiny. And is that true? Is, is that really how you think of it? And again, th this, doesn't, this doesn't matter to, to the the competition side of it. I'm just trying to challenge your brain here to say, if it's so important, is minimum scrutiny the right test? And, and how do you balance that, that type of argument? So, um, but the fact that we got there showed just how great this conversation was. And I really enjoyed it as always. So uh, thank, and, and thank you. And to run a little interference with what Kurt said, that's the subject that he uh, raised is something that you could fill an entire law school Absolutely. course with. So yep. it's not an easy one. So, no. yeah. All right. Good. Thank you all very much. Thank you, so thank much. you judges. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank, so you. Much. thank you for taking the time today, judges. Our pleasure.